Hi there. I am inside of a Jupyter notebook, and I'm once again going to be using my trusty little widget to draw me a data set that I will use. What I'm drawing here is a classification data set, but there's going to be a twist. What you see here are two circles, one inside the other, and the goal is to separate the orange dots from the blue ones. And when you look at this, your initial thinking might be, well, that's relatively easy. And you wouldn't be wrong. Many algorithms inside a scikit-learn would totally be able to handle something like this. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a small change to this classification problem that suddenly will make it a whole lot harder for a whole lot of algorithms, including the gradient boosting algorithms. The point of this video is partially to emphasize that even though gradient boosting algorithms are great, they can't be shoehorned into every problem out there. But there are also many other submodules of scikit-learn that could also be worth exploring that can deal with the situation that I'm about to create for this data set. And here's the change that I'll be making. What you're looking at here is exactly the same data set that I just drew. We've got the outside circle and we've got the inside circle. And the outside circle has blue points and the inside circle has orange ones. The big difference now though, is that I'm taking a very small subset. So only a few blue dots and only a few orange ones are going to be in here. With this change, you could wonder, well, how well can we expect our classification approaches to still work? It's an interesting thought experiment and feel free to pause the video to think about that because the answer might surprise you initially. So let's start by giving the histogram a gradient boosted classifier a spin. I am using this algorithm in the cell block below here to fit me a good data set. And when I scroll down, you can see the predictive results. When this is the input to the algorithm, then this is the prediction that the histogram boosted classifier will make. And you'll immediately notice everything is blue. And that'll be the case even if I were to rerun this. No matter how often, it always seems that only one color comes out over here. And you might start to wonder why that is. We can introduce a small change by maybe sampling some more points. But still, it seems that the default settings of the boosted algorithm doesn't really do what we want it to. And the reason for this is pretty subtle, but you can get a small hint by just inspecting the settings. Notice that there is this min samples leaf setting over here. Uh, let's copy that and let's turn that down, maybe to something like five. When we do this, then we do see that something indeed is happening. Now, the reason why this makes such a difference is because the default setting of the gradient boosted classifier actually assumes that a big data set is going in, not some somewhat artificially small data set like what I've got down below here. And if there's a setting like this around with the default of 20, where we're saying, well, don't make another leaf, unless there are more data points than 20, well, then it shouldn't be that much of a surprise that we only get one class out. It is just going to take the majority class. Now, alternatively, if I set the number of samples back to 10, I could also choose to go for another algorithm. Maybe the K neighbors classifier could do some good here. And just from eyeballing, it does certainly seem like it is uh, doing something better just from the get-go. But also here, we have to mind some of the settings. Right now, it's looking at the nearest five neighbors. And for this data set, you could maybe wonder, maybe two is better? I could even tune it down to one. But all in all, also for this use case, the results just don't look great. Now, one logical response here would be to say, well, this is really not a whole lot of data, and most of the classification algorithms may just need a lot more because in the end, they do assume that there's a big data set to learn from. And especially in this case, one thing that you really see happen here is that we are just overfitting on the nearest neighbor, and we're not really paying any attention to the structure of the underlying data simply because that's not what the algorithm is meant to do. But there are algorithms that actually do precisely this. The main idea here is to rethink the problem by saying that this is perhaps not a supervised machine learning problem, but maybe this is a semi-supervised machine learning problem. And maybe something like label propagation would work a lot better here. In a moment, I will show what label propagation would do to this data set, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to maybe explain some of the intuition behind it first. Let's pretend that we just have a data set with these six points. Then one thing I could do is I could consider that maybe the structure of the data set, even when there's no labels, could be approximated by considering nearest neighbors. 
So the data point to the center over here, these would be the closest neighbors as far as that one entry point is concerned. I could do that for this one point, but I could also do it for some of the other points. So let's also do it for this one. And let's also do it for this one. And I could keep drawing and drawing and drawing. But hopefully one thing that you recognize here is that I will be constructing a graph of sorts. One that's kind of directional. If I'm at a point, there are three places that I can jump to. And if you've taken a course in probability theory, this may sound like a Markov chain of sorts. If I were to describe this mathematically, and if I were to give a name to every single point over here, then one way of looking at it is to say that we've got some sort of a transition matrix, where if I have all of these points listed over here, then I can start filling in some probabilities. If I start over at point A, that would be this point, then there's a third chance that I might jump to point D, or to point B, or to point C. I could do the same thing for point B, etc., etc., etc. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give this big matrix a name, T. T for transition, so to say. So let's now consider a larger data set. And again, for this large data set, I'm able to construct some sort of graph with neighbors. And this would again result in some sort of a transition matrix T. But the interesting thing about this uh, transition matrix is that you can at some point get chunks that are separate. Suppose that I were a frog and I was jumping around randomly and I would start over here only jumping over the edges that exist, then there would simply be no way for me to get over here because there's no arc going from one set to another one. And hopefully you can also see how that might encode something about the data when the data has very clear clusters. So let's now consider what might happen if there's also labels around. So let's pretend that I've got a green label just for this one point over here. And let's say that I've got a red label just for this point over here. Well then, one thing I could do is I could come up with some sort of input array X that indicates where the green points are. There would be a bunch of zeros, but let's say that there's a one which indicates where this green dot with the label is. Well, then what I could do is I could multiply that with my big matrix T. And out of this would come a new array where there would be a third at a few places and a bunch of zeros elsewhere, which again kind of represent a jump to uh, the neighbors, so to say. But you could wonder, well, why stop there? I could also multiply by this transition matrix, let's say n times. Then I would get a different array coming out this array would be a lot more flat. If n is big enough, we should at some point mimic some sort of long-term probability, assuming that this was like a jumping frog. But then this array will represent the probability where the frog will be anywhere on this graph. And where would that be? Well, there will be a uniform distribution on this outer circle over here. And hopefully you recognize that the same argument would also hold for this red point. By resembling this point as an array, by multiplying it with this transition matrix T, we end up with a probability distribution of sorts that will represent a uniform distribution over all the points within this one cluster over here. I suppose I could also put this in more layman's terms. You could also just look at this as a graph where all the stuff that's close to the original green label will just start turning green as well. And from there on, it just kind of starts to spread. Same thing with this red point. It's just that from a maths perspective, there are also very convenient properties about being able to translate this into a matrix that behaves like a Markov chain. There are also all sorts of details that I could go into with this algorithm, but the main thing that I hope that you appreciate is that the way that we're going about spreading the labels is related to the structure of the graph that the points are in initially. And that is also why this kind of approach is usually called semi-supervised. A lot of the learning happens in an unsupervised way with no labels whatsoever, but from that we gain some knowledge and that allows us to just be able to apply our label hopefully more effectively. And especially in uh, low label kinds of scenarios, stuff like this can really be informative. So given that intuition of how label propagation works, let's now make a comparison. This is the result using K nearest neighbors. And if I were to scroll down now, then you see the results using label propagation. And you can see in this case, 
it is a near-perfect classification, entirely as what you might expect. And again, the reason why this works is because we have these two sets of data points that will never have an arc going between them when you only have a few nearest neighbors. When you are really just looking at the nearest three or five neighbors, let's say, the odds of there ever being an arc that jumps from the inner circle to the outer circle is pretty much zero in this data set. The label propagation call that I'm using here uses k nearest neighbors under the hood to construct the graph that I mentioned earlier. But I suppose one final demo that will be good to show is to also show what might happen if I change this data set just slightly. So I'm just gonna draw some extra parts like so, kind of turn this into a steering wheel of sorts. And let's see what happens when this is the new data set that I'm interested in. And now you can see that the results are actually fairly different. And a simple reason is, we now no longer have two circles that don't touch. Because the circles now touch each other, there is also more doubt in the entire system. Sampling a blue dot over here close to the inner orange circle might actually cause the label propagation to believe that there's a lot of blue that should be here. So even though label propagation as an idea is definitely pretty neat, it should also not be seen as a silver bullet. It can be helpful in situations where you've got not a whole lot of label data, but a lot of data that does have internal structure. But once you are dealing with data where there might be clusters internally, but they do touch a lot, then you are just going to have to accept that you'll need more labels. And once you've got more labels, then maybe label propagation isn't what you need anymore. Given a lot of labels, then the classical machine learning approaches like the classification algorithms would also be a bunch better.